Oh, hello, Miss Ruth. Hi, how are you? Doing well, doing well. Well, fingers to the bone. Bless your heart. Yeah. Well, thank goodness it's not hard work anymore. It used to, it used to be where you'd bust the knuckles and everything. And I, I don't bust my knuckles anymore, so. You just push a pencil? Yeah, a, a, a cursor and, and uh, that's what I push around most of the time. <laughs> This thingy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Tim today. Tim's good. Ready for the day to be over? <laughs> I know we won't be here for two hours tonight. Hi, guys. Stephanie. Hi. Wally and Ed. Hello. How do you do? Wade Cook. Wade's on here. Hey, the... hey everybody. All right. We got we got everyone here. Pete, Stephanie, Tim, Ruth. All right. We all set to go? I am. All right. Looks like we're already recording too. Excellent. Um, so we can start our work session. Um, first up on the agenda is uh, I've invited Corinne Hill, the executive director of the Chattanooga Public Library. Um, I saw Christine on here a second ago from the library. Um, let's see if we can get her up. Um, in the meantime, I will give you guys a little bit of an introduction. Um, so back when Vice Mayor Dalton and I were campaigning door to door, one of the items that we found was most, uh, seemed to resonate most with citizens is library access. Um, you know, back when Hamilton County helped fund the Chattanooga Public Library, all Hamilton County residents, including Red Bank residents got uh, no cost library cards through their tax dollars. And since the Hamilton County decided to quit funding the library, then that left all Hamilton County residents high and dry, including all the citizens of Red Bank. Um, so now only city of Chattanooga residents are eligible to receive no cost library cards. Um, now the cost right now to residents of the county is only $50 a year, which is a great value for the services and, and everything that the library offers, but that can still be a barrier for some people. Um, so we want to see about making sure that everyone has access to that regardless of means. So that's why I am proposing a possible pilot program to have the city purchase a small number of library cards and have those available to Red Bank citizens who might want access to the library but not be able to afford it, or that $50 might be a barrier to. And we can just see how that program goes. But I know I've heard a lot of people um, seem to think that the library is outdated or they think of it as a brick and mortar building where you go to check out books, but that's actually just a tiny fraction of the services that is offered by our modern libraries. So that's why I invited Corinne to come talk about um, all the different features that they have available and what comes with that library card that makes it so valuable. Um, now, do we have Corinne on yet? Yes. Hey, Corinne, you're muted. Tracy, could you uh, send, invite her to unmute herself? I made it. I'm here. Hi. Hello, Hi. Ms. Little. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks for the invitation. 
Yes. So, um, yeah, I'd love to turn it over to you and, and have you um, just give us a little rundown of everything that you get with a library card these days. Sure. Um, I have a really um, uh, uh, short presentation and I have um, one of my staff members, Christina Sacco, um, is working with with your folks. So they're going to load it and move it along for us. Sounds good. How have you been? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. Yeah. We're all in the middle now of um, starting the starting to plan for what reopening will look like and what will look like when we, you know, are able to have the public back in the buildings. So that's exciting. Excellent. <laughs> Looks like the screen here is just about set up. It's getting there. <laughs> well, it's amazing that we can um, talk from Isn't this great? across the city and yeah, I know a lot of, my husband and I are avid library users ourselves. Yes, um, I know you are. I have a few books uh, on the table in front of me now about uh, gardening and, and plant identification. And um, and we uh, just started, um, if you need seeds for your garden, I believe that started this back up this week for spring, getting everybody nice. ready. I heard, I actually, I'm going to try starting my own seeds for the first time this year. So I'm hoping to uh, hopefully donate some extras and, and check it out. Exactly. Okay, I think that um, we are ready to go. And I believe Christina is managing this. So if you could go to the next screen, please. Oh, look at that. <laughs> <laughs> so we have five locations. Um, we have five locations as well as a digital branch. And we're currently building infrastructure around um, the digital branch with regards to costs and staffing and infrastructure in that regard. And that's coming from our experience with the, um, with the pandemic. Um, next we have, um, let me see. Oh, next slide, please. So we currently, let me just put it this way for the traditionalists in the room. Um, the book is alive and well, and it is still absolutely um, my bread and butter business. There is no doubt about it. Um, physical books, um, uh, films, DVDs, audiobooks, that sort of thing. But physical books are, are definitely alive and well and doing very well. We have more than 200,000 items available. Um, we also have a, in the neighborhood of half a million dollars in digital um, items that are available for folks to either stream or download. And one of the things from the pandemic, we've noted a significant drop off in audiobooks on CD, as well as um, interest in DVDs. And um, those folks who have been interested in those have now moved to um, streaming and download, which I find rather interesting. Mm -hmm. um, we also have a tool library and what we call a seed exchange. So the tool library, my favorite item in the tool library would be the pressure washer. <laughs> um, and, and if you can get it, we actually had to buy more because we couldn't keep up with demand. Um, and this, basically the tool library is for those of you who, you know, if you just moved into a place and you need an electric drill and you know you will never use an electric drill ever again, uh, you can come and borrow one from us for a week. And as um, we were discussing earlier, we have a seed exchange program, which of course is seasonal. And um, we, we give out seeds. If you're interested, you can get packets of seeds and we'll, we'll take care of and help you with your gardening. Next, what we started during the pandemic, which is going to remain um, when we reopen is our curbside service. So it's more, it, we're just following what restaurants have been doing and essentially you place items on hold, you place your order and we let you know when it's ready for pickup and you drive on up at any of our locations and we put your items in the trunk of the car. Um, recently, we've expanded curbside to, to include concierge services, which is very much a, um, uh, it's, it's right now it's geared toward children. And if you tell us, it's a very personalized service. If you tell us something that your young one is interested in, we put together a, um, they call it like a make and take program. So there's a craft in there, there's books in there, there's all kinds of things that would be of interest to a child who's interested in that particular, whatever that subject was that we were told um, they were interested in. 
So that is proving, have you ever heard the, the term um, killing yourself with success? My youth librarians <laughs> um, are, a little, are a little overwhelmed with the popularity of, um, of uh, um, the personalized uh, concierge service for kids. And then, um, hold on a sec, I'm having, I have to move this. So computers, printing, copy, faxing, and notaries. This is a lot of stuff that we do um, and is very, very helpful for small businesses. Um, obviously providing computer access, um, printing, uh, um, you know, you can come in with a jump drive and get stuff printed. And obviously just your basic everyday photocopying um, and faxing, but we also do, we have a notary service and we have any number of businesses that um, when they're starting out, especially when they're trying to incorporate, this can be a very expensive um, um, budget item in, an, in a small business operation is to get everything notarized. So we're there, we do that for free and it's by appointment. And we are also a passport acceptance service, which is extremely popular. Um, and uh, we're kind of following along with the, um, with the State Department on how that's being, being managed. Um, next slide, please. This is the take and make kit that I was talking with you about. Um, comes in, a, in an environmentally um, um, uh, friendly pair of brown paper bag. We also do virtual programs on, ch on chatlibrary.tv. We have our own YouTube page. These include um, uh, book readings, um, things for children, um, things for young adults, things for students, and this is all programming. And actually this programming is also used by the Hamilton County Department of Education, uh, which we're very proud of that relationship. We also have virtual programs. Oh, you can go ahead and move forward. We also do virtual programming right now um, for adults. And that includes his, um, historical um, programming as well as a Hoopla book club and um, Dungeons and Dragons, et cetera. So there, and again, music. So um, the, the programming for adults, I would say is, is not as, um, 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 what would you, I'm trying, I'm grasping at the word. Um, it, it's not a, as vibrant as, as, the pro, as the programming for children. The programming for children has been developed for years and years and, and um, everyone who works on our youth services staff has um, additional training and education in childhood development. Um, the programming is all based on, it's very solidly based on um, uh, re current research on, on how children learn and how children develop and how children learn confidence and, and, and self, you know, how to become a, how to become better adults. And, and the adult programming has only been going on for us seriously for probably the last three years. And so we're growing that. We're really proud of the programs that we've done. We've really focused on things that we think would be of interest and that are quality programming, not just um, um, trying to get throw, throw spaghetti at the wall and see what sticks. Um, we're, we're very intentional in, in developing this, this um, programming for adults moving forward. Next, please. Uh, when we reopen, this is probably the most uh, missed um, um, portion of our services that we're hearing the most about, and that's access to our fourth floor maker space. We actually, this opened in 2013. We were, um, the, we are the model for how other libraries uh, develop maker spaces within their, within their institutions. And um, we get visits from all over the world. We're an example, not just nationally, but internationally for what a makerspace should be, what it should contain, how do you get one started and then how do you sustain it? This is a space that um, I really, really like things to be decorated. And I love, you know, Henry Miller furniture and I want the right colors chosen. And it took me a long time to get used to this space because it is managed and, and changed and influenced by the people who use it. So that's, it's all done by the community. So it never looks the same and it's different every time I go up there and I've learned to just not say anything. Um, every year, the, the equipment that's up here, it's quite expensive. We got laser cutters, heat press, sewing machines. There's a CNC router. Um, Every year we add, uh, we add equipment based on what the community tells us they really wish they could see. Last year we bought a large size vinyl cutter 
um, not vinyl cutter, I'm sorry, a large size. Um, teachers use it. Plastic. Laminator. Laminator. And we have a bingo, a laminator. And, um, and this year we've bought an oversized printer. So now the people can print um, poster size. So, so with the, the pro, so this floor continues to develop and continues to grow uh, based on how the community uses it and what the community really needs. Next slide, please. This has been a really, this um, was a long time in development. We have a professional recording studio. Originally it was intended to be a learning environment for young children and developed curriculum. And we had classes and we had so much demand for, um, from the general public for use of it. It has, it has evolved now. We still hold classes, but the, we do not block the entire uh, room to just youth any longer. Um, we now, to meet the demand of the public, um, we, we provide, you can get, uh, with your library card, you can get two sessions a month each, I believe it's three hours, and without any charge, without, with no charge. And we've also brought, one of the commitments that I made when we, when we decided to do this was that I was not going to ask a librarian um, to manage this space. And we actually have a professional sound engineer with about 15 years of experience, and he actually teaches um, um, at uh, one of the local um, state colleges um, in online. So he, he's, he's a professional in this business and has been doing it for a long time. This is also used a lot for podcasting. And when we, it, it, that was one of those um, serendipitous type of, of discoveries that it wasn't on the, it wasn't on the plan. If you go back and look at all the documentation to bring in this online, podcasts never came up. And now it's one of its heaviest uses. So, so it's nice. This is this this place has a all of, all professional equipment and 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 the support that people need. And again, we don't do things for you. We're a library. We we show you how to do things. We teach you. We help you learn. Um, so that when you uh, the next time you come, you'll learn something different. So we you you do your own work. We're there to assist and to offer and and offer help. Next slide, please. So local history and genealogy, I would, I would um, absolutely tell you is the quietest floor that we have um, in any of our, at any of our locations. And, um, but they are, the work that they do is tremendous and the, their commitment to um, maintaining and um, archiving and preserving um, Chattanooga's local history and as well as our genealogy um, for this area, for this, um, providing those services, it, their, their commitment is, 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 is it's, it's amazing. Um, they also, just like the youth librarians, they have special training in this, they're archival specialists. Um, they, they have trained to do this their whole lives. And um, const we are a regular source, certainly for the Times Free Press. We are, have become a regular source for, certainly for the new hotels that have come up in the area because of, our, because of the access we have to historical photographs. Um, so, so this is a wonderful, this is, this is one of those best kept secrets um, that you don't realize what's in there until you start talking to people who work there. And it's absolutely phenomenal. And also on our third floor, um, I, I mentioned earlier, we're a passport acceptance office. It's one of our most popular services and um, we do terrific. It's really, really wonderful because we get to find out where everybody in town's going, which is really great. <laughs> Back when we went places. <laughs> yeah, and we have a map and like when we're, when they're working on the paper, when staff's working on getting all the paperwork together, you can go put a put a dot, you know, where you on the map where you're going in the world, and we've been doing that since we started, and um, it's really it's really fun to go and look at because it's like starting to double up, and it's it's really cool. Next slide, please. We also have meeting room space on the first floor as well as up on our fourth floor, and um, also wireless access, of course. Okay, that goes without saying. Next slide, please. 
And this is when I was talking to you about, like, I'm so proud of the services that, that our youth librarians provide. We have a very, 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 very tight um, relationship with the Hamilton County Department of Education. Uh, we provide free library cards to all the children who attend public schools in Hamilton County, uh, regardless of where they live, that's K through 12. And um, we also, we, we provide programming that is, where they can learn from, where kids can learn from doing, um, where they get to have different experiences, where they get to, certainly when we're open, get to interact with, with um, children from all over. And um, our, like I said, our, our youth services people are specially trained, they're highly trained. Um, the majority of them have master's degrees in some form of childhood development. So they really do everything, all of their programming, the, the books that they buy, the things that they provide, the programming they think about, um, it is, 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 is very, very thoughtfully and very intentionally um, developed. Uh, lots of music, they're, we're big believers in music. And so the, what we bring to the children, and I think I told you that um, our online presence now has extended into Hamilton County Schools as well. They, many of the teachers are now using our um, programming, depending on where they are in their curriculum. Well, we have programming that fits into to different aspects of the of the school curriculum. So, um, teachers are now using that um, in the classroom. Our, our library programming in the in the school classrooms. Next slide, please. And this is what I was talking with you about um, adult programming that we have, we've been easing into. Um, we, I, we're, we did one artist in residence, which was really successful. We had a woman who came and taught people how to, how to paint on silk. And um, in the slide up in the left-hand corner, you can see we had an opening for that and people just did amazing work. And unfortunately, by the time we were getting um, ready to, to take applications for our next artist in residence, um, we were we we entered the pandemic. Um, prior to that, you can see we do a lot of um, a lot of cultural programs for adults. We're very interested in in um, again, the, you know the the um, hand dye, the you know anything that that is about doing and making and creating and crafting. And one of our biggest programs um, before we closed was crafting with craft beer. And um, so that all, of course, ended in, with the pandemic. And then we moved into, took it online and it became crafting with craft bevies. And so now it, it's once a month and um, we get a local bartender who, who comes on and shows you how to make a specialty drink, whatever that bartender's specialty drink is. And then you, 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 make a, you, you make something during, on this Zoom call. And of course you use the curbside pickup to come and pick your, all of your items up that you're gonna make that Sunday afternoon. And um, it has gotten so amazing. It's gotten so popular that uh, we have to cut it off now at, I think the last time uh, the big, the largest, I think cut off at 70 was the last number of people who did crafting with craft bevies. So, so we are entering the, um, the, and the, you know that brings us. There's a social aspect to that kind of a program where where people come with their friends and then you get to meet other people, and um, so anyway, we're we're being very intentional again, just like with the youth. But the programming for adults is something that that we've only really been been playing around with for the last couple of years. But what we've done, we've done well. Next, please. And we do a lot of outreach, um, certainly any type of festival, any type of um, anything that's going on in town, we will have a presence there and we can't wait for things to open back up. Next slide, please. So right now, um, some of the things we're, folks, we're, we're focusing on, we're currently looking at um, all of our locations and with regards to um, their, their ability to accommodate everyone, looking at their size, looking at, um, um, you know, where do we need libraries? Where are they currently located? How effective are they in their current location? So we're really doing a system-wide analysis and that's been ongoing. Um, as I told you earlier, we're also in the, in the midst of, of developing an, an, um, a reopening plan. I think some of the programs that we've started such as the curbside delivery service um, and the concierge services via curbside will remain even when we open to the public. And I suspect that there's gonna be some programs that will 
that we used to do in-house that we may not, we may not take, bring them back. And so we're currently examining what we've done, what we're doing and what we wanna do moving forward. Um, super excited and I'm available if you have any questions. Share that, like I said, my husband and I are, are avid library users and it's been a big part of our lives personally. Um, as long as we've been here, and especially the maker space that you mentioned. My husband's an engineer, and I'm an artist by trade, and so we actually have spent a lot of time up there collaborating on projects. Um, we also did a, an art installation there that involved moving parts and projections. Oh, the birds. Yeah, the birds. Birds in the books? Yeah, the, the flapping. That was one. fabulous. Yes, the flying book installation. Mm -hmm. um, but that's how we learned, my husband learned how to 3D print and now uh, purchased and, and has his own 3D printer he uses right. at home. I learned how to sew uh, on the fourth floor makerspace. Mm -hmm. uh, and now I actually bought the same sewing machine that you guys have up there because I liked it so much. So that's great. it's been a very enriching part of our lives to have access to those kinds of um, equipment that you wouldn't necessarily want to buy just to find out if you like it or not. Exactly. Um, it's an amazing, even for, for young professionals, even if you can afford to, to buy a $200 sewing machine or whatever, it's nice to, to get a chance to test drive it and, and learn about it beforehand. And, and that's for, and that's mm -hmm. just for us. Of course, there's, there's all kinds of different applications. And I had actually, I'm glad you mentioned the recording studio. I, yeah. I as, a, as a visual artist and not a musician, mm -hmm. I, I remember now that you have that, but I've never even been in there yet. So there's, there's all kinds of resources. It's amazing. And, and I'm not musical. Like I don't, that's <laughs> not my, that's not my, my thing. Um, but it's amazing what, what's, what's going on in there and the people that we find in there. It's, it's really, really, um, it's a beautiful space. We actually hired a, um, music studio designer um, when we when we received the funding for this and brought him down from Nashville who helped us create this and and made it so that it was also an educational space so there were some changes made but that was designed by a per that was designed he helped us purchase the equipment he's the one who went out and found it um yeah I mean it's the real deal it's great that's amazing well I want to turn is there any other commissioners Do, does anybody have any questions for Corinne while we have her here on the line I don't have any, but I'd like to thank her for coming out and, and doing the demonstration. It's very interesting. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Anytime. Yeah, Corinne, I just have to say, I mean, I've been taking my son to baby bounce. I mean, classes and the toddler bounce and all the youth programming since he was born. Um, and it's the Lego, you know, Fridays and all of those kinds <laughs> of services and programs that, um, really give access to everybody in the community when they wouldn't have it otherwise has just been really, uh, really wonderful. And the socialization aspect, like you said, is really big, just getting to meet other kids and other parents. Um, so thank you. And thank, awesome. your, thank your staff welcome. for that. <laughs> your staff, I will. I will. They're I, wonderful. I, I think the biggest surprise for me about Baby Bounce was um, the motor development skills that were being that were that were that were being taught there. Like I yeah. had no idea, right? So, um, but yeah, the the learning like clapping. So mm -hmm. I I knew a mom who took the child who'd been going to baby bounce regularly, you know, all along. And when took him took the child to the to the doctor for a checkup, and the the little one was clapping. And the doctor asked her, like, when did he start doing that? And she said, Oh, we do that all the time in baby bounce. And he said, You need to keep going to whatever <laughs> that is because he. His motor skills are, are, are far ahead of where he should be. Right. Um, and I'm thinking whatever you're doing, you need to keep doing it. So um, that, was, that was pretty powerful. That was pretty powerful to hear a mom, mom say that, you yeah. know? So, but thank you kindly. Thank you. Yeah, I've heard the, you mentioned the being able to check out things like a pressure washer. I've heard that referred to as a library of things. Um, so like, like you mentioned tools and things mm -hmm. that you out in addition to uh, books and other things. Oh yeah, I mean, there's all kinds of stuff in there. I, I mean, it's just, yeah, you have to sign a waiver. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, legal, 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 legal thought. You know, that that's the other thing. The city of Chattanooga has an amazing legal department who, you know, they 
they they work with us and and will listen to us when we say here's what we want to do <laughs> they're like you want to do what <laughs> and um and they work with us and they work through it so that we are able to accomplish it and and to that i'm extremely grateful but um but yeah because like there's power drills and and um i think they i think one of the last things they bought also was like a an edger you know a grass edger um <laughs> so you know it's, it's a waiver item <laughs> Yeah, and uh, digital projectors. We have two of those. Oh, right. Ooh, that's, as an artist, that's that's good to know because that's I frequently have you know I have one at home and I'm sometimes lending it out and people ask where I, where they can find them. Exactly, a good price because sometimes as an artist you just need it for one job, you know, for a few right. hours and that's it, and it's not worth paying you know exorbitant. It's price. also really cool for families if you want to have like you know on a weekend night have a movie oh, in the yeah. backyard. You know, yeah, that's kind of fun. Have yeah. <laughs> I don't suppose you create a relatable outdoor movie screen uh, in your library of things. Oh gosh, wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> to go to go with the projector. Yep, you got it. Go and I was just gonna add. Um, I didn't think it was mentioned, but um, one one really um, unique feature of our library is that um, we take requests. So um, it, that that all that applies to books, but that also you know DVDs, et cetera. But that also applies to our tool library. So if people in the community really need something um, that we don't have, we have a form on our website for them to request. Oh, that is a great idea. Absolutely, we we're all about you know, we give people what they want. Um, and if we if you don't see something that you want to read or watch or listen to or use. Um, that you need in your life. Um, if we're able to get it, we will. We absolutely will. And we have contracts with every library vendor in the country. I mean, we're, we're very fortunate in that we have multiple, multiple vendors. So there's very few, th there are very few things that we can't get our hands on. Very few things. Well, I have to say your curbside service is a big hit with Red Bank citizens because they, a lot of times I hear complaints about being able to find parking for the downtown branch, but the curbside really takes that out of it. It takes it out of it. And like I said, this, it's not going to go away. It's right. far too popular. And, and again, speaking to the parking situation, because, you know, I'd like to say that there's plenty of parking in downtown. It's just not free. <laughs> 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 I've never, I, I go to downtown branch all the time and I never have a problem um, finding yeah. a, a street parking spot nearby. Yeah. So, so anyway, but, but again, to, cause I've been hearing that since I got here in 2012. <laughs> so I think we have, we have finally found a solution we can, we all may be able to live with. Even the Hickson branch though, that has plenty of parking. It's great that, you know, if families have kids and car seats to be able to just go oh, yeah. and pick up their books and not have to get everybody Absolutely. out. <laughs> Absolutely. If you've ever watched a mom try to maneuver all of that. Yeah. All right. Anything else? I think that's, I think that's it. Um, Tim, uh, uh, having Corinne on here is a kind of you know, entryway into a discussion about this library card program. Um, we're hoping to fold that into our next budget discussion. Is there any next steps we need to do? Um, should we take a kind of barometer of interest for that going forward? What do we need to, to do for this? Uh, that's, that's a discussion that can happen when we get into our budget sessions. Okay. Um, commissioners can feel free at any time to, to give me a call and talk about it, but that, that's when it would be needed to be funded or brought forward. Okay. Well, um, thank you so much, Corinne, for joining thank us. You. And uh, we hope to be in touch. Absolutely. You know where to find me if you have any questions. <laughs> yeah, thank you. you all. Bye bye. And seeing you again, Stephanie. Nice bye -bye. to see you again. All right. Um, moving on to the item number two is much quicker. Um, no mow zones. This is a pretty basic idea. I'm sure most of you are already familiar with the growing crisis of the disappearance of pollinators, especially bees that are crucial to our food supply. And one way that's really simple and effective that we can help preserve these pollinator species actually costs nothing at all. In fact, it could even save taxpayer dollars. And that is no mow zones. 
So that would be designated areas in se selections of the parks. You can see Tim has it up on the screen here. Um, we collaborated in selecting a few areas that are um, not only not high traffic, not high foot traffic, but really underutilized areas of our parks or areas that aren't really that useful because they're around water retention basins or they're steeply sloped or they're out on the margins far from walkways and that kind of thing. And we would designate these areas as no-mo zones and, and pollinator habitat restoration. Uh, we could also include signage if we wanted to just make it extra clear to our citizens that this is being done intentionally. It's not neglect, it's an intentional uh, habitat preservation um, so the last slide that was up is the around the basin, the water retention basin at White Oak Park below the dog park. Is that right, Tim? That's correct. Yeah. Uh, so it's a steeply sloped sides going down into that pool of water. And then the next one, this was one that we were considering that's up in the uh, upper area of White Oak Park where it's uh, the highest area where it's pretty flat. And these are some areas that aren't really um, trafficked or used that much. Um, although that particular slide, Tim, I was thinking because of that drainage buffer that has to be maintained at the at the forest edge, um, I was also considering that steeply sloped area between the upper and lower parking lots um, where that drainage ditch is as another potential location. And then I think, do we have one more? Yeah, the community center. Um, so this is just the edge of the lot. Um, so to the outside of this community center is Hamilton County Schools property. Um, so this is basically just a few feet, um, you know, a mower's width or two of uh, pollinator habitat preserved on the edge of the property of the city of Red Bank property line. Um, so yeah, I wanted to run that by you guys and see what you thought it could be okay with with trying a few of these small areas as a pilot program and just seeing you know, how it goes. Any thoughts or discussion on the matter? Well, well, there's a lot of other things that live in no, in no mo zones too, <laughs> such as rabbits, which, which and rats and other rodents that are, could be a little less desirable also. <laughs> I mean, the, the reason that, I mean, from where I'm at and from what we do, there's always a buffer zone around the, uh, even if it is a wooded area behind something, you always have buffer zones to keep the, that keeps the rodents and everything out of those places. They, so they stay, they stay in the woods and all of that such too, except at night, you know, then they all kind of ease on, scurry on out. And you would be amazed at the amount of wildlife that is right downtown on Hamilton Place Boulevard at, at 3 a.m. in the morning. I'm talking rabbits, coyotes, all of this stuff that are in and out of these buffer zones. So yeah. uh, I'm not I'm not against, but I'm throwing up a big warning here that this could be uh, um, also something that could be, um, I mean, you know, it's, I mean, there's some less desirables out there. Let me put it that way, you know, for the wildlife. Sure. That's a good thought. You know, you kind of get the good with the bad, you know, wildlife is, is wildlife is, is bees, is rabbits, is, you know, squirrels and chipmunks and deer and, and all these things. Um, you know, you, you inc improve the habitat carrying capacity for, for some and you, pretty inevitably increase it for others. I, I would suspect at an area you know, like the ones outlined on the picture that the rats would probably prefer the big wooded area across the street to a, to a four foot wide strip of, of grass that's about 12 inches tall <laughs> over on the, on the turf area. But um, I'm sure it would be more you know, wildlife potential than, than a perfectly manicured turf from edge to edge. Um, definitely, some, definitely something good to think about, but that would be the nice thing about a no-mo zone is it's reversible. So <laughs> we could always, you know, if we leave it as a no-mo for, you know, a few months or for the spring and we find that we suddenly have a huge overrun rat problem, we can mow it, mow it down, you know, after the fact and, and say, you know, 
we we tried the experiment. So it's it's nothing, you know, permanent infrastructure. And again, not only no cost, but but less cost. It's it's less than we're already spending to pay somebody to go out there and mow it and to put the gas in the mower and maintain the, the equipment and all that. That's all. I saw a question in the chat. Um, native plants could be planted there, definitely. Um, that was from, oh yeah, direct message. Yes, we could plant native plants in that in that barrier. There's there's two different ways you could do it. You can just straight up make it a no-mow zone and just delineate where it's gonna be and just stop mowing and just let grow what's gonna grow. Um, another method that could be used is to actually remove the sod that's there and replant with native plants and pollinators and, and create an actively managed pollinator habitat out of it that would have wildflowers uh, in the spring and summer and be um, perhaps even more attractive than a no mow zone. All right. So would anybody actively object to giving this uh, experiment a, a brief try, try this spring and giving Tim the go ahead to, to see how it turns out? I'm not ready to give Tim a go ahead. I'd like to go out and walk the property and look at it. Sure. Yeah hands on and look at it. Um, I know that the parks are used by a lot of children and um, I, I'm, I'm along with Pete. I uh, live on a wooded acreage track up here and, and uh, you'd be surprised at the wildlife and, and the undesirable wildlife that comes out. So uh, I, I think that it could be a liability. Um, so I want to I want to take time to go and look at it with Tim or one of the public works guys before I um, before I grade anything. Sure, I think that's a great idea because um, we have several different sites suggested here. So we could do, you know, one of we could do three of them. We could do one of them. Um, you know, I'm open to other suggestions. These are just a few potential sites that Tim and I came up with, um, just giving a, bro a brief overview of the maps of the parks. Um, like I said, the, the areas that we're proposing are areas that have demonstrated pretty low actual traffic. Like people don't really use that area for recreation. They're on the margins, they're on the edges. There are steeply sloped or boggy areas that aren't really useful for recreation, so we can make them useful for um, wildlife habitat instead. Um, I am curious, the, the liability, um, do you have a particular type of wildlife in mind that you think could pose a liability? Are you talking to me? Yes, yes, Commissioner Janelle. Coyotes and snakes and, um, you know, we're overrun with coyotes in Red Bank right now. Okay. Be pretty dangerous. That would be my thing is, you know, I mean, because you're increasing their food supply, you know, so and they go where the food's at. So that's my only thinking. But, you know, I don't, I, I don't know. I'd like to walk the property myself to do. Okay. Have there been coyotes spotted in White Oak Park or near the community center before? Oh, yeah. Red Bank. I, mean, yeah, I lived out here in the woods for about five years and I think I saw a fox one time, but I'm, I'm yet to see anything bigger. <laughs> Maybe you're not looking. We, we've got deer and coyotes and foxes and um, you, you name it, we've got it. A, a turkey, I saw a bob couple turkey, of So, I mean, you know, even a bobcat one time. Oh, wow. Yeah, I saw a couple of deer once, so that was about it. All right. Um, well, and that, any other thoughts before we move on to the next item? Good. Um, let's see, we have resolution for paving bid. Tim, would you like to talk about that item? Yes, we received uh, two bids in for our paving of Dayton Boulevard. And that paving is from Greenleaf Street north to Browntown Road, um, which is um, resurfacing Dayton Boulevard. We also have a signalization project that's about ready for bid. And when we get it bid, it will include the upgrades to five signal locations, along with uh, uh, pedestrian crossings at those five locations. 
Okay, so this bid does not include the upgrades to the pedestrian crosswalks, but the signalization one will. No, the the uh, the pet the pedestrian cross crossings are tied to the signalization, so it they they have to be done during the signalization project. And I may have misspoken one meeting before and was thinking that they would be during the paving, but they have to be done during the signalization. Okay. Um, and this is a large dollar amount. Is some of this is covered by grant funding? Yes, it is. Uh, Eighty percent is by grant funding. Grant funding. Twenty percent is by the city. Eighty percent. Okay. Any other questions, by? Yeah, is, is this going to be a milling field? Are they milling up to the curb? Are they are they uh, milling the entire things? Doing any trench milling, or are they? Uh, yeah, they, there there is milling involved in this project. Okay. All right. I mean, are they? Do you know if it's going to be a two-inch reclaim or just a just an edge and then do top it? Uh, it varies in different locations. They measured the crown of Dayton Boulevard. Okay. If you get above Ashland Terrace, it's a whole lot worse. The crown. So mm -hmm. it's it's been looked at. Uh, some places are less than others. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay, any other questions before we move on? No. All right. Well, on number four, we have a resolution for stormwater utility study. Um, so this is what we talked about last work session. Um, and I actually left it at, I was waiting to hear back from MTAS what the cost would be. And they did get back to me. And actually, it's no cost to the city to do a thorough uh, analysis and study of our stormwater rate structure and make recommendations. Um, so this is just a resolution to allow Tim to go ahead with that uh, study. Is that right, Tim? That is correct. All right. So any questions about this item? No? Okay. No. Well, then, do we know how quickly it would be able to be scheduled? Um, I haven't got into that deep of conversation with them yet. Okay. Uh, this is just one of the first steps. So as soon as I get this approved, it'll allow me to move forward. Okay. Thank you. All right. Any further questions? No. All right. Well, in that case, we'll have the last item on the agenda, yard of the month. This was just a cute idea that um, as constituents and constituents sent me. And they suggested that we could have code enforcement award a yard of the month award. It could just be like a little yard sign that moves around from month to month to um, reward and thank all of our citizens who put so much work and effort into beautifying our city through their own yards. Uh, and also just create an opportunity for positive interaction between a code enforcement and the citizens. They um, have something to look forward to maybe if they see the code enforcement officer driving around. Um, so this would be a pretty minimal expense because code enforcement's already going around, obviously. Yard sign would be super cheap. So just wanted to run it by all of you and see what you thought about it. Um, Do they have to get a sign permit? <laughs> <laughs> Asking for a friend. <laughs> it's, on, it's on private property, so. <laughs> uh, really, we did that uh, for years when we had the Red Bank Neighborhood Pride Group. Yeah. We did that monthly. How did that, so, was that well received? It was well received, but it came to the point um, that, you know, the award was given to the same people over and over, you know, because you didn't have that many. And then we had people that actually declined to have the sign put in their yard. So, I mean, you know, you, you know, we can try it, try it again. Uh, a lot of people were thrilled to have it. A lot of people just said, no, thank you. So, uh, Interesting. Not against it, so. Okay. I think, I think it'd be a, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, the, the only problem I have is it's very subjective, you know, I mean, this is, you know, beauty is in the eye of the beholder, uh, you know, uh, uh, I mean, if you try no mo zone in your own yard, you get, you get a, a, a different type of sign in your yard. So, uh, you know, but now other than that, um, um, you know, I, I, I like the, the community involvement and, and, and the, the, I do think it would be something very positive for our uh, 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 
citizenry and going through the thing. As long as we put it on our Facebook, we need, I mean, uh, this is part of the thing about rebranding Red Bank that, that, that I think is very important. So, you know, I, I don't hate it. And instead of having the codes enforcement officer, we could use our website and Facebook page and have people nominate people in their community. Oh, nominate yeah. them. They could submit it and then we could choose. Or I like that idea. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Tim, what do you think about nominations? Is he, that's doable? Yeah, I, I don't know about using our Facebook page because we just want it as um, not so much comments on our Facebook page, but we could put something out where they can contact us or email us with, with their thoughts. Okay. Well, they can use the private message function um, in on the Facebook page and it wouldn't go, you know, it would just be a direct message to the city and not to, and not be public. Um, yeah, I also, I like the idea of once a winner is chosen, like uh, Commissioner Phillips said, uh, posting a photograph of that yard, maybe with the sign in it as a, look, this is, this is this month's yard. Look how beautiful Red Bank is. <laughs> we did that. We did it with the community news. They would come out and do a, a photograph every month. Ooh, with the, was it the Ridge and River News? Um, that did that? It's just the community news, Red Bank, you know, this, I guess it's what it's called now, I'm not sure. Red Bank Signal Mountain. Okay. Yeah, did that. sounds good. Try it again. Okay. Um, any, we're, we need to wrap it up soon. Do we have any other business for items not on the agenda? I, I would like to give an update on our sidewalk project that we have going on here from Newberry to Greenleaf. Um, we're progressing real well. We've had to make some changes in that sidewalk. Some of the areas that um, we're going to have curb and gutter, we're going to cause a problem with the businesses for uh, people to be able to get in and out of the parking lot. So we've, we've had to lay those sidewalks down and remove that curb and gutter, but it's moving along well, and then we'll be moving to Ashland Terrace. Okay. Yeah, I'm excited to see those going in. And I, I was actually uh, hoping to ask you about that first section right by Newberry, um, or on Dayton Boulevard, just north of Newberry. I noticed it didn't have a curb. It just, it's a continuation of the pavement, but right. for parking for the business. Yes, yes. If we, if we would have did curb and gutter, you wouldn't be able to get in and out of there because that building sits so close to the road. So, is is there any plan to delineate that for pedestrian safety, at least like a, a paint demarcation or anything like that to indicate to drivers that to stay off of that area? Yeah, when we we're going to have to shift those lanes in there because the sidewalk had to take part of that lane, so we can put a um, side marking along there, you know, to delineate where the road is. Okay, great. All right, well, uh, any other items before we adjourn? Okay, well then in that case, um, I will see you all at six o'clock. Good, thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys.